Hello everyone, I'm Christy Oliver, the Professional Development Manager at Davis Publications. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for our fifth session in a series of weekly webinars that take place on Tuesdays at 3 p.m. through mid-June. Today we are thrilled to have Leah Smith and Michael Townsend of the Tape Art Crew with us. They will be providing an overview of their work with a focus on how they use art for healing. A few quick housekeeping things before we get started. We would love for you to ask questions throughout our time together. The best way to do that is to type your questions into the chat box or use the Q&A button. Both can be found at the bottom of your screen. We'll be monitoring these throughout the session and we'll get to as many questions as we can in the hour that we have together. Also, just a reminder that we are recording this session and after we finish today, a link to the video will be emailed to you and will be available for viewing at davisart.com slash free resources for anyone who might like to watch. I'd love to introduce our speakers today. Move to the next slide. We'll start with uh, Leah Smith. Since graduating from Wheaton College with an English major and fine arts minor, she has found herself at home on many collaborative art projects from an absurd dance video called Dancy Town to a 144 hour long video installation project exploring the mechanics of memory in relationships. Her longest running collaboration has been with Michael Townsend and the tape art crew, and she has been throwing down massive tape murals since 2011. Alongside all of the tape wrangling, she has helped to design and facilitate countless, countless tape art workshops and has been working in school and education settings for more than five years. Michael Townsend, um, since the first tape art drawing in 1989, Michael Townsend's work has focused on making colossal temporary public artworks and teaching collaborative tape art drawing to groups in schools, senior citizen centers, prisons, and public spaces. As someone deeply interested in discovering ways for art to serve others, Michael has created more than 1,000 murals in healthcare facilities and in communities affected by tragedy. He has spearheaded more than 500 public art projects nationally, as well as in Greece, Germany, China, and Japan. To expand the possibilities of tape as a drawing medium, he developed a drawing tape uniquely suited for the purpose. Michael holds a BFA in printmaking and an MFA in art education from the Rhode Island School of Design. I'm thrilled to have you both with us this afternoon, and now I'm just going to turn it right over to you. <laughs> All right. Hello. Let's uh, go to the next slide. So uh, my name is Leah. That's Michael. Michael. <laughs> we are uh, two artists who draw with tape for a living. So that mm -hmm. is pushing tape against walls and making drawings and murals. Our larger art practice with our the tape art crew sort of falls into four bins and categories. One of them is public art. So those are the big murals. They're often commissioned by museums or festivals. Those could be anywhere from like 100 feet, two or three stories high big, big murals on the outsides of buildings. We also do public humanities projects. So that is working with communities to design large participatory artworks that sort of reflect the communities in which they are made. Mm -hmm. uh, another bin that we do is education and leadership. That's workshops in schools, community centers, corporations, focusing on how people work and draw and make art together. And then the final one is our art and healing practice, which is what we'll talk about more today. Yeah, we're going to focus on the art and healing uh, in particular because of the, the times we're in right now. And you know, right now we've got a lot of parents and students and teachers who are experiencing uh, anxiety and stress and, and in a lot of cases, pure tragedy. And the arts play a critical, critical role uh, in these times. And we want to show you some of our experiences using tape art uh, with a lot of different types of communities and a lot of different circumstances, but all with an understanding that the outcomes tie back to healing. And to start that journey, we're going to bring you to 1995. Switch to the next slide. <laughs> and we're going to share with you an experience that thrust us into the world of uh, the healing arts. Uh, at, at, at this point in my tape art practice, I'd been doing large murals and teaching for about six years. And in this particular year, we were on a national tour. And in the middle of that tour, we ended up in Oklahoma City in April. And we were there for the bombing of the Afropi Murrow Federal Building. We had come in to the city to be 
participants in a festival to just make art and, and beautify and have a good time with the people. But the festival was canceled. All the artists were sent home. And we asked the head of the Arts Council, can we help in any way? We have, what do we have? We have one awesome skill we can draw with tape. Surely that can be useful. <laughs> Surely. So they asked us, do you work in hospitals? And we boldly declare, yes, of course we do. Which, All right, we'll shift to the next slide. <laughs> yeah, at the time was uh, a lie. But we were given an opportunity to work in a local children's hospital. And we're gonna roll a short video here that's gonna highlight our work in hospitals, our work in school, and then one big public art piece. And the first images you'll see here in this video are just some you know, old VHS tape images of the first time we stepped foot into a hospital environment. The one patient that sets in motion our work in hospital environments is a young man who's been pulled from the bombing site. He is about nine years old. He's immobile, but he can talk. And when I was brought into his room, I asked the simplest question, which is, what do you want on your walls? And he replied that he wanted a clown being chased by bats. I was like, oh, this is perfect. <laughs> How many bats do you need? And from that point on, he laid in his bed and he directed me where to go. And what I learned in that moment was that we were able to provide for others a sense of ownership over their space. And uh, ever since that one hospital room, we've been going to hospital rooms and asking that same question, what do you want? What do you need? Had we worked in the hospital, we then went and worked with the two schools closest to the bomb site. This is, uh, they were quick enough to organize us to work with a middle school and a high school and remember, these students have just experienced the terrorist bombing in their city. Some of their windows had been blown out by the concussion of the blast, and they were back in school. And tape art gave them a chance to explore what was happening to them emotionally, what was happening in their communities. Uh, these images you see right here are from the hospital. And then you're gonna see some students working on walls. Uh, and in particular, we'll take a, a short pause here. We see a person, I'll keep going a little bit more here. We are giving them a chance to, in this case, literally draw, pause there, pause here, draw the incident and have a chance to talk about it objectively. And the theme of our work there was uh, the rise of the Phoenix. It was the idea of you know, how, how do we become better, stronger, uh, after something like this has happened. Having done the hospital and the schools, the city manager came to us and said, I would like to invite you to come into the heart of the rescue operation. So if we continue this video here, what you're gonna see is some pretty mundane looking footage, but it's the inside of the Myriad Convention Center, which, which at the time was under martial law and housed the ATF, the FBI, and special rescue units from all over the United States. And from this room here, they went out to do recovery of people who had been trapped in the rubble. So when this pulls out to fold, let's pause, let's pause here. This wall right here is a wall that is catty corner to the one entrance and exit to this room. And that means that every rescue worker walks past this piece of real estate to do a 12 hour shift. And when they come back in, this is the first thing they see. So they leave with the memory of our progress. They come back to see how- It's a marker of time. It's a marker of time. The drawing is an open metaphor uh, and it is the depiction of people making wings. At the bottom of the drawing, there are literally tying feathers onto wooden infrastructures, attaching them to people and casting them into the air. And it's this uh, drawing about people working together to set people free. We can let the video roll at this point. And we can actually go back to the slide deck. Yeah. So for us, this was the first time we had used art to reflect in real time what was happening to a community. Right. Now, Leah had mentioned that we had done, we do a lot of public art pieces. One thing all those public art pieces share is that when they are done, we remove those pieces. They are 24 hours, they are intentionally temporary. We went to remove this piece. And the city manager said, you can't take it down. 
and to our alarm, actually. And, he, and when asked, when can we move it? He said, we'll call you when we are ready. So at this point, we've the, the artwork has transferred from us to the community that it's in. And they called a year later, uh, almost a year to the day. They said, our official period of mourning is over. You can come remove the work. So this was eye-opening for us that the work could serve a purpose in our absence. And we have been pursuing the, the, the values that we learned in this, in this time period ever since. Yeah, if you skip two slides ahead, we'll talk a little bit more about you know, some, some of the other instances in which we have sort of seen the benefits of healing happen through the tape art process. So how drawing on walls with other people has provided some sort of healing relief for those communities. So we're gonna show you 10 uh, examples only. Uh, the, the next slide here shows you a, a, a oh. list. <laughs> and that list, when first presented with it, is sort of a, sort of a, a barf of all the things that we are aware of when we're working with different groups. These are the sort of the values that we know that tape art can uphold when groups are working together. We'll have an example for each group in the upcoming slides. So um, don't worry about getting the whole list down. <laughs> yeah. And when we're working with these groups, we are, for the most part, these values here are uh, implicit. <laughs> implicit. They're not explicit. They're, we sometimes will have debriefs afterwards and talk about what happened, but we regardless of what our goals are going in, implicitly all of these things are happening in the background mm -hmm. uh, with this tape art process. So I guess for each one of these examples, we'll also try to highlight why tape art, mm -hmm. why did tape art work in this circumstance? All right, let's go to the, the next slide. We're gonna talk first about the idea of stewardship of space, which is the fact that it is important for people to feel connected to the buildings and spaces that they occupy and that they share with others. So that sort of making art directly on those spaces can create a sense of not only responsibility, but unity and agency. These are just a few pictures from a large residency that we did at a local Rhode Island uh, high school. The student body, almost every single student drew as part of this week long <laughs> series of workshops. So, and they covered over 75% of the walls. You, yeah. walked, you walked into this building and it was like walking into a, uh, an old Egyptian temple with hieroglyphics just sprawling on every single sight line. And even more importantly than the making and transforming of this entire school space was the removal of the work. So all of our own artwork, we always remove within 24 hours of its creation. With student work, we're also really interested in the idea of having the students connect with the idea of temporary art. Now, sometimes that is a week after the art is made, uh, instead of just 24 hours, but. And it's counterintuitive to all the teachers and adults in the room. They're like, wait, no, why are we tearing this down? This makes no so sense work. at all. <laughs> we spent time, we spent money, we had resources. The removal of the work has been reported to us over and over and over again as the moment that the students truly coalesced around why they did it. Mm -hmm. It is a, your, okay, let's highlight why tape art. Why does tape art work in this case? Yeah, I, I mean, the first and foremost thing is the idea of getting permissions because the work is temporary. You can make large work on so many walls that normally are closed off to making this type of, of art happen. So getting the, the thumbs up to say, yes, go ahead and do it is a lot easier when you know that the work is super temporary. And to the point of removal, that's a second form of permission. You're also giving them permission to have complete control over the things that they made. And by giving them permission to remove it, they get to experience a profound joy that a lot of other mediums don't necessarily automatically provide. Mm -hmm. All right, let's, let's, let's roll on to the next slide. Yeah, the next one we're gonna talk about is the idea of a right to public voice. <laughs> yeah, and this is something we, we really believe in working in public space is that everybody, through some medium has to have some opportunity to be able to express themselves. And what you're seeing here are two images from uh, a group of special needs students that I worked with in the late 90s in New York City. We did a year of residencies in, in different schools. And this particular school caters to just special ed students. After six months of working with them, doing curriculum-based projects, 
they were skilled enough <laughs> that I said, look, if you pick anywhere you want in this entirety of Manhattan, and I braced myself for Statue of Liberty, World Trade Center, Central Park, something big. And they were unanimous. They said, we want to work at police headquarters. <laughs> I was like, all right. <laughs> Went to the PR, Pearson Police Headquarters. I said, I got a group of folks that need to come here and draw. Gave them the whole details. And they said, please come in. So in a bustling police headquarters, this group of students got a chance to interact with the public and talk about the things that they're excited about drawing. And they spent a day drawing and uh, Having, it's a group of people that just generally aren't uh, seen or heard as much as they should be uh, in our society. And because tape art can not only go anywhere that you're interested in expressing and having a voice, but it does so at such a large scale that it, it draws attention yeah. in a way that sometimes so why tape art, art in this case? So why tape art in this case, I think, has a lot to do with the permissions, of course, but the clarity of tape is a clarity of communication. So because it's line-based work and it's, as Leah mentioned, like pretty big, the right to public voice means that when you have the voice, the voice is communicating pretty clearly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, let's move on. Public voice. <laughs> public voice. <laughs> Next slide. Ah, Embracing risk. risk, okay. Yeah, so this <laughs> terrifying <is> and healing. <laughs> <laughs> what you're seeing here is a collection of teachers from one high school that have been asked to draw together in front of each other. There's two art teachers tucked in there and the rest are all expertise in their own fields. Mm -hmm. There's nothing worse than asking a group of teachers to uh, step outside their comfort zones and not be the experts all the time, especially if, the, if what you're asking them to do is art. <laughs> so I wanna make a correlation here between embracing risk and uh, vulnerability mm -hmm. that in, when you are doing something like this, doing something you, which means you are uh, performing in front of your peers. In, in the, real time. In real time, <laughs> in a medium that you sense that you have no control over, you feel vulnerable. Now, why tape art in this case is because the work is flexible, temporary, movable, mm -hmm. you actually do have control and you are able to counter correct, you're able to grow the work, change the work, there's no, la there's no sense of permanence mm -hmm. to the pieces that you're making. Right, so while you may be making mistakes in real time, which is a risk, you can also fix those mistakes in real time because the tape can be peeled back, peeled off, changed, you're not waiting for paint to dry, you're not erasing, you're, you're literally sort of working your way towards a better solution and it's the type of thing where somebody else in your group can sort of walk over and, and help you say, oh, I think that maybe like together we can, can make this figure a little bit uh, closer to what we want. Yeah, so one of the words you'll hear pop up a lot when we talk about these types of projects is the word empathy. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine this scenario here where everyone's freaked out, but the empathy engine kicks in and they look at each other and like, oh, you're freaked out also. Yeah, that it's a risk for the whole group to be doing this. So any feelings you're having are the feelings that the person next to you is also having. Yeah. And there's nothing like drawing large scale in the public to uh, create that sense of risk. real state. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's take a look at the next one on the list here. All right, collaboration. Collaboration. Something that we intrinsically do with tape art. Yeah. We never draw by ourselves. So let's, <laughs> and we're trying to draw a line here between a uh, line between collaboration and healing. What you're seeing in this image right here are 300, 350 employees from the Hasbro toy company. All drawing at the same, same time. time. Okay. <laughs> Context. The Hasbro toy company in the months leading up to this drawing had had a lot of reorganizing and what that is, had resulted in is quite a few layoffs. This is all very public. Lots of layoffs, lots of reorganizations of the teams within the company, and that had created an environment. Emotional chaos. <laughs> of emotional chaos. The work environment was injured. People's feelings were hurt. People were uh, anxious. Missing their friends, now having to work with new people. It was, uh, it was sad. It was sad. <laughs> sad. So we had contacts in the company that reached out to us and said, hey, you know, we know that you do a lot of work in healing and you do corporate leadership. Is there something we can do that focuses on healing, but without being explicit about that. We're like, yes, yes. <laughs> Let's, at a bare minimum, create a scenario where we can get 350 of your employees in the room at the same time and get them to draw together. So this is a massive act of collaboration. 
Mm -hmm. And why taper? Why taper? Uh, well, I, to start with, you can have that many people drawing together at the same time. Again, these ideas of scale, this is a medium where any space that you can fit people in is the size of the artwork that can be created. Yeah, collaboration also turns uh, strangers into friends real fast. Mm -hmm. When you're collaborating together at this scale, at this speed, you're also setting in motion the possibility that you're going to impress the daylights out of each other. They were all so moved by each other's work that they, for lack of a better word, fell in love with each other that day. So you went from a company that felt sort of like fractured and wasn't sure. Had a little bit of a lack of identity. <laughs> like, to feeling so psyched about each other as co-workers, makers. as fellow makers. And uh, this, this medium continues to provide those types of opportunities. And we never get bored of seeing large groups consume the spaces that are in front of them. Great. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Now, we're going through slides fairly rapidly, unless Christy stops us with a, a, a pile of questions. We will go back to any slide at any time afterwards. If you're like, whoa, 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 mm -hmm. flag a slide in your mind, and we will return to them to sort of dive deeper uh, you need to. as needed. <laughs> Yeah, all right. A, a good spot to remind people that if you have questions, please use the chat box or the Q and A. But yeah, they keep yeah. going. Everyone, yeah. Awesome. yeah, we're about halfway through, and we're just we're, we're providing a, a an a, overview, an overview, mm -hmm. so we can get back to it. developing social skills. <laughs> what you're looking at here is a agency in Tokyo, Japan, that works with young adults with special needs mm -hmm. specifically to train them to go into the corporate workspace right so in japan there are uh, employment quotas for uh people with disabilities so that means that yeah, 2.2 percent mm -hmm. so all these companies are very interested in the idea of providing training and connections between their employees and future employees and creating this sort of bond and training for skills so we went in there when we were working with uh, GE in Tokyo. And found out that they had a connection with this institution and said, hey, we'd love to bring in GE employees to work directly with them in the spaces that they occupy. What that looks like is two or three GE employees for every student. And they're making together under the theme of what business would you run if you could run any business? So on the walls, you saw cake bakeries, soup, uh, soup stands. Uh, I think there was a Christmas tree shop and a florist. But what it really required was a lot of navigation for both sides. We had the GE employees who had to listen really carefully and try to sort of navigate uh, the desires and wants of the students and the students trying to figure out how to communicate uh, what they wanted to express. Right. So in both cases, both parties are developing social skills at the same time. They, and they both need to evolve simultaneously in order to get to the best results on the wall. Mm -hmm. We'll go to the next slide. Yeah, to the next slide here. <laughs> Inclusivity. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <sighs> so this medium has over and over and over again proved itself to be really good at meeting students where they're at. And what that has resulted in is lots of opportunities for students who are often not included in collaborative projects, a lot of times because of physical or psychological challenges, to be brought into the fold to make with their peers. Mm -hmm. uh, we're highlighting one student here just to give you some quick stories about uh, a case where we have photographs and we have a picture of the students we absolutely adore. <laughs> All right, this young man here has cerebral palsy. He's in a high school and the two pictures to the right of him are uh, the, the Rapunzel. Sure, Rapunzel. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> the way the way this unfolded is the Rapunzel character was was the the brainchild actually of of two young ladies who I would refer to as alphas. <laughs> they just people who sort of like kind of own the school a little bit, and they're like, we're going to draw Rapunzel, and it's going to have hair, and it's going to fall two stories down over this balcony into the courtyard below. And they, I watched them debate how they're going to make the hair. And they couldn't figure out a, a way to do it easily. And I said, you know what? There's a young man over here in a wheelchair who could totally crush that task. Let's bring him in and see, see if he can help you out here. So our, our guy here has hands 
that essentially do this gesture. They fold in. That is, that is their main skill. But if you provide tape that passes through his hands, so he has someone working with him, he can fold and make decisions about the intensity of that mm -hmm. fold. And therefore, he can crimp the tape as it passes through mm -hmm. and make hair. So this guy <laughs> became a, a, a hair making factory. Mm -hmm. uh, and all the students working on the Rapunzel coalesced around him. So they just mm -hmm. cheered him on as he produced two the stories, strands, of, strands of hair. That guy has an incredible sense of humor, and it was uh, delightful to see him central to the creation of this artwork. Mm -hmm. And the drawing below, this is his idea. It took a while to sort of like <laughs> cess it out of him, but it's an idea about an alley full of cats and trash. That's what he wanted to make. Um, he used his incredible crushing powers to make all those piles of trash. And then he, uh, some of the lines on the walls were ones that he, he helped direct onto the walls. And then we um, just coached him to sort of direct us to the rest of the drawing. Yeah, and uh, we've seen this even in sort of more uh, traditional school settings where you're just in hallways, but oftentimes, this medium will, will be something that students can excel at who aren't always the normal art champions. So we've seen sort of like uh, boys with lots of energy being able to let that free on this medium because yeah. it will meet their ambitions for, you know, space and taking up big artwork or big walls. Kinetic. Kinetic, yeah. So sometimes it will allow for both the little details and the careful rendering that some yeah. students prefer, but also the sort of like large ideas or sculptural ideas or textural ideas that right. other students might work better with. So that's the why tape art in this case is that it can meet each learner where they're at and their own sort of inclinations about how they Make deal things. with physical mediums. Mm -hmm. And it can integrate them all into one piece. Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone can do art, oh, yeah. which is slightly different than <laughs> it's inclusivity. It's a different thing, right. Um, this deals more with the idea of people who don't believe that they can do art. Right. Where <laughs> which we see a lot of that happens in the adult realm. Yeah, the further, the further older you get, the more convinced you are that you can't make art for a lot of people. As we mentioned, we do a lot of work uh, in uh, corporate training, which means we're staring down rooms of professionals who are incredibly good at what <laughs> they do, but when asked to perform artistically, as soon as they hear the word art, they're done. I can't, I can't, can't I can't, it. I can't, I can't, I can't. Well-practiced theatrics, tears in eyes, stick figures, can't do it. Straight lines, can't do it. So the drawings we're seeing in here, uh, the two on the left, as you can see, are, are from the same party, were made by two employees of the General Electric Company who declared to us that they were the worst artists in the world and meant it from the bottom of their hearts. <laughs> You're like, that is a bold claim, my <laughs> friend. <laughs> <laughs> that is true art. <laughs> so what they wanted to render was an image on the wall of someone having crashed into the wall and passed through it. Outside. And so you could sort of see a pastoral scene beyond the wall. And they struggled. They, so in an hour of drawing, they spent 40 minutes complaining. So what you're seeing here is 15 minutes of drawing. And their solution is better than the solution the two of us would have come up with. We were, I'm going to say, we were kind of mad at them. <laughs> they proved to be better artists than us in a short period of time. <laughs> And we really tried to illustrate this, and we like pulled the pictures on our phone. We're like, no, bro, look, <laughs> they're better than we are. So we're sharing this story to sort of just tell you that uh, because this is a new medium, mm -hmm. it, it, it was a wide tape art. A lot of times yeah. the tape, as Michael said, because it is a new medium, will skate past the ideas of mastery. There is no yeah. like artists of tape, you know, of art history past that have artworks made out of tape that everyone knows and is picturing. There aren't the same types of standards in everyone's mind for what is a good tape art piece versus yeah. what is a good painting. It doesn't have the stigma of big art. Right. So yeah. sometimes that can provide a little bit more freedom uh, for makers in terms of creating something and being satisfied with the thing that they have made. Right. <laughs> Because that truly is the best tape art they've ever seen, and <laughs> us too. So, okay, 
That's <laughs> we've got uh, four more, uh, three more slides to show you. Yep. Let's go to the next one. Transformation. Oh, transformation. So we're highlighting one student here on the left side of the slide. You see a young lady in a red and black plaid shirt. Uh, this is a project from Canadian, Texas. 2,600 people living in a, in, small town. in a small town. We went down there to do a residency that included a lot of school workshops as well as public artwork. And in one of the school workshops, we showed up. It is bright and early high school morning. No one wants to be in art class. And this girl has got her like head on the desk. She hears that we are going to go draw in an elderly home. And she just biggest sigh possible. You go, what's wrong, buddy? <laughs> and then she was very vocal about it. One. She doesn't like old people. Doesn't Two, like them. She doesn't like art. Oh no. <laughs> Three, she doesn't want to leave the school. All right. like, wow, you're, you're you're not gonna have Trifecta. a good, you're have a good day yeah. here. So the when we're doing tape art residencies, we like to create scenarios where we bring students out into the community to work with uh, old folks' homes, community centers, right. soup kitchens, rehabilitation centers. So mm -hmm. students using art to serve. Okay. So this young lady, when she gets into this old folks home, mopes around for about 10 to 15 minutes. Then I overhear her say to her team of three other artists, if we're gonna do this, we need to make it meaningful. <laughs> I was like, wow, all right, great. She comes to me and she says, how, how do we make this meaningful? I say, well, maybe if you go talk to one of the residents, you may find someone whose story intrigues you. 15 minutes later, she comes back with a 92 year old in tow who's very talkative. And between the two of them, agree that they're gonna make a quilt. And so that's the image on the right. You can sort of see this quilt shape. And she listens so patiently as this woman describes all the, the major chapters in her life. And that team of artists draw all the chapters in her life, including really complicated things like how do we depict a miscarriage? How do we depict falling in love? How do we depict the fact that she has a memory of the local Native American Indians looking up over the hill? At a rodeo. At a rodeo below. And in the image on the left, you can see her giving the final presentation of her work to all of her peers. And we were able to witness the greatest thrill for any educator, the transformation of a student in real time in front of us. So why tape art? Tape art in this case employs, because of the circumstance we put her in, an empathy engine. And empathy is one of the greatest drivers to change. And uh, yeah, because it allowed for her to make art for somebody else, because mm -hmm. the art was physically in a location where it was serving a real purpose, it created more of a driver for her and her group to make something that they felt more connected to than maybe they did in their day-to-day -day art class. Yeah. It's good to see your students cry <laughs> as well. So, okay. We'll look at two more and then we'll dive into some questions. All right, next slide. Catalyst for dialogue. So this is the idea that not just is the, the process of tape art important in terms of collaborating, mm -hmm. but what you're drawing uh, can be a catalyst for talking, which in a time where we're all experiencing a lot of things may be a really useful tool for figuring out how we deal with the challenges of this new reality. Right, so the, the two images you see here are one's from a uh, high school and on top is a depiction of the students drawing the supply chain for a cell phone mm -hmm. with a focus on the disparity in wages for everyone along that journey. And so it has, it starts with the mines in Africa to, for raw materials, passes through China, and then slowly goes up the chain. So we see, we see uh, the, the coders, we see the app makers. We the see people, people who install sell. the cell towers. Right. And they had them look up how much they make every year. And it was for a lot of them, a epiphany to see that so much. Uh, Just what the effects of a single object can be. Right. The one on the bottom is sort of a similar uh, depiction, but is more towards the idea of fashion and how does fashion get created? Where, where does a shirt come from? Mm -hmm. 
and these are really like specific examples. We were doing a project sort of based in uh, sociology class, but this can be held true for any workshop that you're running because the tape allows you to uh, make changes in real time as you're drawing. It's a really good way to talk things out as you're making a piece of artwork. We never work with students in a way where we create really hard sketches in advance. Right, we right. always sort of keep the uh, brainstorm open. It's about creating a, a visual goal where we're like, I, I think we're gonna end up with something like this, but never having it so that we become uh, Xerox machines. Right. So that any time during the drawing, even though we said maybe we're gonna start by drawing the fashion industry, what that actually looks like can change as we talk about it and we can talk about it as we draw. Right, so they can pivot mid-drawing. Mm -hmm. As new information comes up, as new connections are made, they can add those and they can mm -hmm. subtract from the drawing also. So that Right, so if they're like, oh, I drew this, uh, you know, factory, but in fact, what's more important is to highlight the original fields from which cotton came from. Right. Or right. maybe instead we should focus on this other aspect and because the tape can be added and removed really quickly. It's an active dialogue the entire time. Mm -hmm. You're not trapped into the idea that you had at first. Right. And uh, the last example from that list we showed you at the beginning will be this one here with a responsive and temporary. Uh, this drawing was made- At Hampshire College. Hampshire College in April uh, after the Boston bombing, the marathon bombing many years ago. Uh, while this drawing was being made, the state asked people to shelter in place because they were doing a manhunt for the people who had done the bombing. The students were freaked out, uh, but we were doing a tape art exercise with them. And we said, look, this is an opportunity to sort of draw what you're feeling. <laughs> For lack of a better word, let's 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 look at it from a logistical standpoint. Let's let's break this thing down. So, what you see in this drawing here on the left-hand side are three homes, and these are three families sheltering in place. And on the right is this transverse Rex, and that was how they decided to depict the horror of this manhunt. That there was this singular thing mm -hmm. that was terrorizing everybody, uh, and why tape art in this case here is that. The temporary nature of tape takes away the weight of permanence. And that's really important when you're trying to, to explore an emotional way. When you're trying scenario. to process what you're feeling, knowing that what you're making is not something that has to define a space or you or a community forever, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. means that you can be a little bit freer in how you depict that. For instance, this group may not want a Tyrannosaurus Rex to forever be on their wall or to express something that is scary and uh, heavy, have it be a permanent image in their community and a permanent reminder. But, but without question, in that moment, that was absolutely the best way to represent the horror that they were feeling. So yeah, the fact there. that it can come down is it's best quality. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, there's uh, a couple more images here at the very bottom that are from our work in psych hospitals. Our work in psych hospitals. We'll flip through them real quick just so you can. Well, before we move to that, oh, yeah. can we go back one sec, one slide. Of course. Just because we have a couple of questions yeah. about the temporary nature of the tape. So it seems yeah. to make sense that we um, pause on this for a minute. Please, so, yeah. Um, Folks would like to know when do you, when you're working with a group, when do you introduce the idea of temporary or taking it down? That's a good question. We, we uh, load that up front. We make it very clear that the work is temporary from the very beginning. And there will be a natural impulse from a lot of students to be like, what? But then so why are we doing it? What's the point? <laughs> that fades really quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a knee jerk reaction. But in the informing them that it's temporary, you are giving them a massive amount of freedom, mm -hmm. whether they can articulate that or not, when they're making their right. work. They may not feel it until the end. <laughs> right, and that's how you end up with the T-Rex, <laughs> because it is temporary. And, 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 and they're a little bit more willing to explore and make mistakes. And the teacher's job is to, to capitalize on those, on 
the mistakes. I mean, the mistakes in the good way where they're, they are, they're like, oh, trying something new. Yeah, something we always try to say to them is that the removal is in fact a really fun process. Peeling tape off a wall is like weirdly satisfying and destroying yeah. art is also something we just don't do very often. There, we've done a lot of projects at museums where we've invited the public to come to the museum to take it down. And the number one question is always like, aren't you sad? And we always just remind them, they're like, no, like ripping things is joyful. And, and when you watch the public <laughs> large public tape art pieces it is smiles ear to mm -hmm. ear it is pure joy it's very fast so in that very first slide when you saw all the walls 75 percent of the school mm -hmm. covered the amount of time to take down the entire school if every student went out to remove it 15 minutes yeah and we always recommend that the removal happens at a time that is close enough to the making that they remember the feelings of the making right so one to two weeks sort of max if you're trying to really focus on getting those benefits from the removal because yeah. after that time there's more disconnect between mm -hmm. what it felt like to make it so that the removal of it is less powerful yeah you want the emotional energy to still be present mm -hmm. you want them to miss the work when it's yeah. gone also there's nothing like missing artwork <laughs> yeah that's a great gift you can give the whole community is make them think oh i think we, we should want do more again. art <laughs> So the typical time frame, I know you just kind of answered this, but just so that it's um, clear, the yeah. typical time frame you would suggest for leaving up a mural would be one to two weeks. Yeah, yeah. one week is one week is really is, really good. Is really good. Two weeks if it's a if there's an emergency. What Some, emergency <laughs> means like parent teacher conference is coming up, but it happens to be two weeks out. Mm -hmm. But one week I think is sort of the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. And then it sounds like in this case, and you've talked to um, some other examples about the debrief that you do at the end with yeah. the participants. Um, people would like to know, like, what is the typical frame for that conversation and what are some of the responses that you can expect to get? A lot of times those debriefs are really focused. Uh, yes, there's like a discussion of like sort of what was actually made and what good techniques we saw mm -hmm. and the art side of things, but a lot of times it's more about the art behaviors that we saw. So those are behaviors like risk taking, like working through ambiguity. So you don't know how to draw with tape, but I'm asking you to keep drawing with tape for a certain amount of time. So you've got to work through the idea that you're doing something well, not knowing how to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you don't know what the metrics for success are but you're still continuing to move forward. Yeah, so debriefs have a tendency to break uh, into, into two main categories. There's the content of what was made and there's the process of how it mm -hmm. was made. Uh, a lot of times in schools, a lot of the debriefs focus primarily on content and the way that we uh, like to direct those debriefs is we have a walkthrough. So we walk to each section of the mural. Usually sections are done, you can identify teams five to ten people made this wall and you say okay we need a representative from this team to talk about what was made here and you can do it in two ways you can have the students just talk about it or if you have the time you can ask students to translate it so the makers can hear, can hear. what their uh, audience is interpreting from what they've made <laughs> yeah one of our favorite questions to ask any any the whole group is after they've talked about a wall is to ask if you have another hour to work on this. What would you add? What would you improve? And because of its temporary nature, they can envision making those types of changes. And it can be, that can be a really valuable as far as understanding their understanding of the What artwork. means done. <laughs> yeah. Something we always do when we start a workshop is tell students that there's no way they can finish in the time that they have. Right. Because even if we, for instance, me and Michael will look at a wall and know that we have 20 days to draw on it. And we still know that like if we had 20 more days, we would fill up those days as well. Um, right. Because we are coming up with the drawing as we're going. If we had a sketch to begin with, we would know when we were done, but because- We'd have a sense of when yeah. we were done, right. But we wouldn't be done. But otherwise <laughs> you, you have like infinite ability to continue to evolve a piece. So we always just sort of, emphasize that uh, when the buzzer rings on the time, you've uh, gotten as much done as you can in that time. Yeah. Okay. One last quick one on this slide and then we can keep moving. Um, how many students for this particular example and how long? Sure. So in this particular example, we're on a college campus. 
uh, this is, I believe, four to five hours with a team of about 10 to 13 students. Mm -hmm. um, what consumes a lot of the time here talking. is talking in this particular case. And the T-Rex is really well rendered and big, so that's ladder work. Mm -hmm. In the majority of the examples that we showed you. Like that first one. If you look at that very, very first slide, if we can go back to uh, the one that sort of shows those long panoramas. So that would be the slide about stewardship of space. Yep. In the stewardship of space, you're seeing the results of a typical classroom session, which is you want to provide a, at least an hour of drawing time. So the work you're seeing on these walls here are students who have been given an hour to draw. Mm -hmm. This is multiple classes. Multiple yeah. classes, right, as far as the length goes. Mm -hmm. For each body on the wall, envision, if you will, that is one student for each body. In, and including the backgrounds in and around that character. At an hour, 55 minutes being the minimum, they can produce a work that is satisfying. And we have, we have hit this with, with a stopwatch for decades. Mm -hmm. And the breaking point between 50 minutes and 55 minutes is huge. 50 yeah. minutes is not enough. 55 minutes is your bare minimum, an hour makes a difference. Hour 15, super good. That's a lot of that's because this is a medium that none of, you know, right. most people haven't touched before. So mm -hmm. a lot of the time that you're getting going is like trying to experiment with even like what it means to rip the tape, what kind of lines can you make? So having even an extra five to 10 minutes is like a really big deal. Yeah. And the more time you give them, the more opportunities they have to step back mm -hmm. even further. If you go down, just to answer this question in its entirety, go down to the bonus slides at the very bottom, Tony. There's um, underneath, oh, there it is, nice. So the next slide. Bonus photographs. Thank you. <laughs> so this is a slide of an in-class, in-school field trip. So these students were given permission to be in this space for the entire school day. Pizza was brought to them. <laughs> so, <laughs> and if you go to the next slide, you can get a sense of the intensity of this drawing. So this is a pack of, this is on a stage. At a it's on a stage. So it's 25 to 30 students drawing all day long. So you can see how intense the sculptural solutions are there in the foreground, how high and long this drawing is. Uh, and if you were, you know, five or six pictures more of this and you'd see all the little tiny windows on their mm -hmm. skyscrapers. But that helps gives you a sense of the difference between an hour and six hours. So that's like a really great way or solution if your school is willing to give you an in-school field trip. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah. If you have 40 minute periods, you can do you can do it over the course of two classes. Yeah, definitely double them up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that will allow you to like, even in the second half, like ha maybe, you know, they've stopped halfway through at the beginning of the next class to say, okay, like before you start going again, like, you can see this work with sort of fresh eyes. What do, should you change direction? Should you pivot? Should you keep going? Right. And so Tony, if you go down to the very last slide, I believe there's a good picture here again. There we go. This is fifth? Second grade, I think. Yeah. Second, third. All right. Second Elementary grade. school. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an hour and 15 minutes with some pretty high functioning elementary school students. But this gives you a sense of uh, how intense they can be in that time period. And they were all, these, these students were all business. There was no talking. They just, we gave them a prompt and they dove right in and drew. Uh, this was an after throughout. school program where and they had signed school. up for tape That's art. right. They really wanted to do tape <laughs> art. And you can tell. Absolutely. <laughs> She we do have some questions about the actual tape. Yes. I know we have a slide on that. We have a slide on the tape. Yeah, let's talk about the tape. The tape is, <laughs> my God, do we love talking about tape. You ready? So <laughs> here is the tape. This is called Picto Tape, and that is a brand name of a specific tape designed for drawing. We played a heavy hand in designing this tape. We have scoured the earth looking for the best tape solutions for drawing and we can guarantee you can imagine you, we're pretty picky <laughs> this, this is it what does the tape do well there's a list here on the left uh, 
It comes in two colors, that's blue and green, to make a new color, quarter million dollars. So for right now, we have just those two colors. Beyond that though. Beyond that though, it curves really well. So this tape here can be applied to the one inch. Yeah, right here. Applied to the wall and curved with ease. Most tapes that are low adhesive don't do this. Standard painter's tapes are designed to do one thing, which is be straight. This stuff curves really well. Uh, example of that is this. So, da -da 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 -da. a lot of tapes cannot do this with ease, especially paperback tapes. Okay. All right. So, it's low adhesive and removes really easily. And the adhesive is really thick, so not only does it remove, but it can be put back on many, many times. Yeah, that means that corrections can be made. Yeah. Whereas uh, tapes with less glue on them means that uh, a lot of it ends up on the floor. Yeah, it's one and done. <laughs> Rips really easily. This tape is designed on a two inch core, which is uh, not an industry standard. Industry is three inches. It's the only tape on a two inch core, which makes it much easier to handle for younger hands mm -hmm. and just pleasant to hold for older hands. <laughs> you see on the face here, nose friendly. That's because a lot of tape stinks, like just actually stinks. Like yeah, you, adhesive. Yeah, so if you work in a hallway with like that tape, they'll. Yeah, just, one roll, maybe not a big deal, but you have a hundred rolls, rolls out. Not cool. <laughs> All right. Three widths, two inch, one inch, half inch. Half inch and a two inch core, glorious for drawing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, I had two kids. And so Davis sells the school kit. So there is a pile of tape that's enough to do two full workshops of 25 students drawing for an hour from one kit. And you'll still have some tape left over after that. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to mention about the colors because I know I think sometimes as art teachers we just want like the whole spectrum. <laughs> but having I can tell you that um, having worked with both Michael and Leah and large groups of students who have been using the tape for a long time, um, we find that especially if you have a limited amount of time, the limited amount of colors really does help um, in the sophistication and the decision making. It keeps things moving. Yeah, and let's I mean the students are making decisions between light and dark rather than whether they like a certain color or not. Right. Um, especially right. because the tape, uh, you can't really choose whether you want like which shade of green you want. So it's more about the line and the filling in the space than yeah. it is about. Uh, many, many years ago, I, I tested that theory by introducing a third color and I kept the stopwatch on it and what I found is that on average, murals were being produced at around 10 to 20% slower. And we suspect the majority of that came from them associating the colors with specific things. So like, oh, it's yellow, that's the sun. Mm -hmm. right. And so then they get into little tizzies about like, well, if it's the sun, can it also be eyes mm -hmm. and flowers? So they started making hierarchical decisions about color that, that slowed them down. And a lot of times it, it means, just, uh made the results so that they didn't look as unified. So yeah. you've got, you know, say 20 hands drawing, and even if the style of drawing, the line quality uh, and thickness is different from student to student because they're using a limited color palette, the end result still looks relatively unified because of the two colors. Yeah. Right, and I think also we had some questions about surfaces, but one thing that I think is truly amazing about the blue specifically is that it pretty much looks amazing on like any surface that you create. Yeah. Unless you have um, a wall that's this color blue. <laughs> the blue looks really that exception, awesome. yes. <laughs> there's, I think there's a slide on the bonus slides at the bottom of that dilemma where there's the blue mat, and at that point you got yourself green tape, you're in good shape. Um, there so it is, there's the blue dilemma right there. <laughs> We did have one question about choosing a surface or if you have any tips for, um, it sounds like someone um, is using Picto tape, which is great. Yeah. We're so excited to hear that. Um, on school walls, which are that like crazy glazed, like hard glazed brick. Yes. Um, and then also like what, so what do you, what is the recipe for success when choosing a wall or what should you be aware of? Um, I know sometimes paint, you know, paint is great, but Maybe right. not every painted wall. So, uh, 
in general, always test the tape before you use it. Uh, this tape here, we have been using this particular adhesive solution for close to 20 years with 99.9% .9 success ratio. What's happening in that one, that little piece that doesn't work, the wall is unstable to start with. That yeah. means that the paint is deteriorating. Peeling, it was poorly painted to begin with. Right. In general, you'll find that you can test the tape by putting it on the wall, giving it some pressure and pulling it off. If it doesn't pull the paint, then you're in good shape. Almost every wall in a school is painted with an industrial level of paint that's designed to, to last for the ages, which makes it really great for putting this tape on. If you are skittish about it, if you're worried about it, brick, concrete, pavement, asphalt, these are all- This has a really spongy adhesive. We yeah. draw outside a lot. So a lot of tapes, like you go to put them on a dusty surface, like, sorry, like <laughs> it's gonna come off, but we do, almost exclusively outdoor drawing for their own art practice and we never clean walls before we work. No. We always just put the tape directly on any sort of surface that we uh, are working on, dirt or not. Now you can draw on glass. Mm -hmm. Glass has, carries with it an asterisk and the asterisk is two ways. There's a chance the tape may not stick because sometimes there are cleaning agents that leave a residue and you'll know pretty quickly that it doesn't stick. <laughs> and the other way is that the tape has a UV reflective backing but if the, its belly is exposed to the sun, there exists a chance, it's just a chance that some of the adhesive will remain on the glass. That is easily cleaned with a glass cleaner. Glass cleaner. Mm -hmm. But you need to know that going in. And in general, when you're looking for a wall as far as like aesthetic to things go and, and ease of, of taping, we just recommend that you look for the, the cleanest, emptiest walls. Like obviously the more space, the better. Gymnasiums are usually, if they don't have bleachers on both sides are usually great. Hallways, if they don't have lockers are really great. Outside of schools, if the weather is really great. Um, yeah. Yeah, we just recommend anything that doesn't have, make students work too hard to work around bulletin boards or Lockers. other, <laughs> <laughs> other uh, disruptions. Uh, if it can be done safely, stairwells have also been a good option yep. um, in terms of uh, giving a lot of big students. Blank walls. Yeah, <laughs> big Please, blank walls. Stairwells rarely have things on the walls, and so they're great campuses. Awesome. I think let's go to the slide for the questions so we can talk a little bit about the book that you all wrote. Sure. <laughs> um, so we are going to... Um, pull a winner from the attendees today for a free book, which I think mm -hmm. is awesome. I know um, having used it as a teacher and also with teachers, it is an amazing resource for anyone who wants to start doing this um, mm -hmm. in their schools. So many photographs of tape art in there. Yeah, 30, 30 years of tape art packed into that one book. <laughs> and then let's move to the next slide. Wait, if you, sorry, want to go back one. We also have lots of other resources for you um, on and surrounding tape art. We have this session, we'll, we will record and provide. We have another free lesson that you can access. There is another webinar that we did earlier in the year with even more beautiful tape art eye candy for you. Um, but we have a couple more questions if you want to answer. Yeah, absolutely. We're Great. all yours. The, we're willing to hang out for as long as we want to hang out. So we're, all, we're, we're here, here for the grant. Right. We'll take a few more here. Um, so what do you suggest that teachers can do with tape art now that we are social distancing or even thinking about um, back to school and the various configurations that that might look like? Yes. So uh, we've started doing some tape art teaching via Zoom. New world for us, as it is for everyone, I'm sure, on this call. Uh, some experiments that work when students are away from each other are you could create a narrative that is in panels. So you can have a central character that all parties agree on, and there can be a rendition of that central character that shows up in all of their artworks. And in that case, we just recommend that whatever that character is has a uh, defining feature, like right. a certain hat, Wears glasses, has a cane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this is just an idea about like if you as a class can come up with a storyline, then 
you can sort of give that story to every student individually to create their own uh, panel of that. Right. You can do brainstorming round, round robins where you could you know, do everything from basically having a hat full of suggestions that everyone pulls from and they have to draw someone else's ideas. Because it'd be really fun, sort of a sort of a secret Santa uh, mm -hmm. drawing wise. Sometimes that's good because students will be a little bit more ambitious if they're giving an idea that they know they don't have to draw. So like I normally would not suggest the idea of drawing an octopus playing badminton. Uh, it's a lot of arms and a lot of it's impossible to rackets. Draw. <laughs> <laughs> but I would love to see Michael draw that. <laughs> yep. So these can be like even just sort of like funny and joyful little uh, requests. Uh, coming back from school, uh, that's just sort of a question of your wall space mainly. Um, right. You can, if, there's, if they are doing things, if you're in a, uh, a scenario where they are uh, enforcing social distancing or putting emphasis on social distancing, you can use that idea of six feet as the catalyst for drawings. So you can do really beautiful drawings on the ground. Imagine if you take the tape and you create a compass and that compass starts in the middle and this line is three feet long and you make them draw a circle around where they stand. So that is a six foot space. They can then from there create uh, narratives or even just pattern making. And you can imagine in a, a large open atrium space or a cafeteria or a gym. Beautiful circle patterns along the floor. Everyone has their own personalized, beautified space. And it would sort of mark the time really well and give them a chance to sort of embrace the madness a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so th those, I hope those are some, some, some good examples of things you can do. Yeah, it's hard, it is hard to collaborate uh, remotely. <laughs> we'll give you that. So here's an interesting uh, question. Um, can you describe or have you had any tape art disasters and what can teachers do to avoid them? Tape art disasters like <laughs> what kind like of socially, socially or yeah. like <laughs> materials wise <laughs> <laughs> like just what are the things that they should avoid when working with a group of people or what are some of the things you've learned in working with um groups or students that people should avoid doing yes, 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 yes. things that do not work <laughs> things that don't work um time time is the first disaster <laughs> so if you uh, create a scenario where you're asking a group of people to make something in 40 minutes, they will not be satisfied with their work. It will be hurried throughout. Mm -hmm. if, and and we, we consider that a disaster because they didn't get the benefit from the advantages yeah. of this process. A lot of the disasters are also can happen in the brainstorming part. So as we said before, we don't do like sketches in advance, but there are like brainstorming sessions. And we have seen times where facilitators will sort of see a group start to flounder and they'll be like oh no this group isn't coming up with an idea they're not working together well and try to sort of like step in as the authority figure to sort of bring the brainstorm to fruition but that oftentimes means that the group no longer feels connected to what they're going to be drawing yeah. in a way that can uh create disenchantment so a, a, a variation of that as a disaster is when a team's like we got this and they take out a piece of paper and they draw out exactly what they're going to make. And then for the next hour, everyone is just sad. ascribed to that paper. They're just sad and they're not motivated and they don't change anything mm -hmm. from the drawing. And sometimes that first idea is not their yeah. best. That's a disaster. Yeah. Um, other disasters, there's not that many disasters. No, it's not that. <laughs> The reason, the reason you're finding us being hesitant is because our success ratio for participation is so alarmingly high. We don't have moments when, when there's protests and everyone puts their tape down and they like, I don't want to do this. We, I remember vividly the first student who said, no, I don't want to do this. And I'd been teaching tape art for over 17 years at that point. I was a third grader in central Massachusetts. He's like, I don't feel like doing this. I was like, what? <laughs> Is that true? Um, so, words and letters. Oh, That's yeah. a good one. That's not good. In our practice, 
we never have words and letters. When we teach tape art, we emphasize that as one of the core things that will make the drawings go well. Take, make that the one true boundary, no words or letters. We suggest life size, but if they want to draw miniature people, so be it. But words and letters we have no tolerance for. The reason is this, rarely does it look good, one. Two, we'd like to emphasize the idea that you can speak without words or letters. We refer to that as the international rules. We want you to be able to, to, to provide your thoughts to pictures uh, so everyone can read them. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, very rarely, you'll have a student who will really push back on this, partly because they don't want to be told no, but part of it's because they can't seem to figure out a way to How to, to get, draw the thing to, that they want to. Right. Sort of a scapegoat. Yeah. And we'll work with them. Mm -hmm. We'll figure it out. But that can create, a, that can chew up a lot of our uh, uh, time and energy. The problem is that when you start to write letters, and we've seen students do this, it's impossible to collaborate with them. Like letters can't be built off of. They just, like you write the word love in the middle of a wall. Like if you draw anywhere near that, you can no longer read it or understand the piece. So it creates these islands of meaning that no longer uh, function as things that other collaborators can work off of. Right. And the only thing, and this is just being, you know, uh, diehard optimist, but what I would label as a disaster, and I'm just being really transparent with you, is that sometimes we see groups underperform. <laughs> and their underperforming is only frustrating to us because we see the potential. And it's rooted not necessarily in skill, it's rooted in art behaviors. And the art behaviors have to do with their tenacity and their willing to, willingness to collaborate smoothly with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will be, we will be dissatisfied <laughs> by the results of some people's works and isn't truly that the disaster. <laughs> so I don't know if that answers the question. We can, is that I think help? Perfect, yeah. Okay. Um, let's move to the next slide. I just want to remind everyone that we are having weekly webinars every week through mid-June on Tuesdays at three o'clock. Um, the next one that we have will be um, Bet Naughton, who will be talking about adaptive art, which fits in so nicely with all of the things that we've been talking about today. Um, and then later in the series, we'll hear from experts on um, teaching photography, mindfulness, making murals, fashion, engaging with contemporary art at the elementary level, and lots more very fun things. Um, you can sign up for all of that and find all the resources from today at davisart.com slash free resources. Um, we also have other really great um, resources for you that you can find there, like access to the Davis Digital Platform, the Professional Development Sessions, School Arts Magazine, on-demand videos, lots of great things to help you all through this time. Um, I'd really like to thank our presenters today, Leah Smith, Smith and Michael Townsend. We really appreciate you sharing your time with us. And thank you everyone for joining us. We hope that you all stay safe and healthy and we hope to see you again in a future week. Um, we will stop recording now, but we will stay on for a few more minutes to answer any um, burning questions that you might have. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> thank you all. Thank